Listen for the word of God in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. The word of God. My mother made delicious veggie burgers. It's one of her specialties. I'd like to say it was all about the patty. Not true. It was the finished burger. She would fry these patties and place them inside hamburger buns, not the cheap buns. And then she would line a pan with a moist kitchen towel and line up these loaded hamburger buns inside and wrap them snug. This was a system. All of this was then set inside of a glass pan. Closer to mealtime, that glass dish, it went into the oven and the buns began to steam and the moisture of the towel and the patties warmed and the two became one. And then all the toppings would come to the table, mayonnaise and Miracle Whip, because a family of six, nobody likes the same thing. Ketchup, no mustard, pickle relish, Walla Walla sweet onions, Tillamook mild cheddar cheese, iceberg lettuce, and if the season was right, Decent tomatoes, generously sliced. My mother made delicious veggie burgers. So at our church, my mom got the veggie burger assignment often. One veggie burger moment is every December. December, the month for in-gathering. If you know, you know. And if you don't, we can tell you that this is when church communities, in the Adventist tradition, we would go out, usually on the weekend, Saturday night, sing Christmas carols on the front porches all around the neighborhood. Each mini concert would end with this appeal, and I can almost remember what we would say. Good evening. We are from the Vancouver Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we wondered if you'd like to help the less fortunate in the neighborhood this holiday. If you forgot what to say, the prompt was taped on the backside of the offering can. That offering can was usually preloaded with some coins we could shake or sometimes dollar bills folded and peeking out the top. The people inside the house would decide, do we want to help the less fortunate? Every encounter ended with a, we wish you a Merry Christmas. These were cold Saturday nights, often drizzly, sometimes snowy. But back at the elementary school, the kitchen was full. Hot cocoa was on tap and the veggie burgers, my mom's veggie burgers, are in the warming pan. We knew that once we sang up the neighborhood, hit them up for pocket change, we would drink up and eat up, warm up, back at the school. You know what I noticed those cold Saturday nights? There's always someone, usually several someones, who passed through the veggie burger line, but they skipped the ingathering task. Usually several. More than once I heard this phrase, oh, I just came for the veggie burgers. They didn't come to socialize with all the people. They didn't come because they had nothing better happening on a Saturday night. They didn't come for the in-gathering or for the less fortunate of the neighborhood. The veggie burger was the why. So before we get all judgy, and I'll be at the front of that line, there is a why to everything. It's some kind of intention, with intention or default. We, with precision or apathy. There's a why to everything we do in our personal and our professional lives, in our relationships with our faith community. There's always a why at, at work, even when it's, um, I'm too tired to do anything different. That's a why. This is week three in our series. This invitation during the series is to stand in the intersection pre and post pandemic, stand here for a while together as a community and ask why as we resurface and return or reimagine and reinvent. Rather than quickly resume our pre-pandemic lives and our pre-pandemic church, can we use this intersection to slowly and carefully assess? Borrowing language from Simon Sinek, a few weeks ago I shared this chart, this graph, a golden circle. This golden circle, most of us know what we do and how we do it. We work this circle from the outside in, the what's. We wake up, we brush our teeth, we shower and go to work and school, and we talk to friends and we get our work done, and, and, and we know what a day in our life looks like. These are the details, the logistics, the data, the language. The inner circle, though, uses a different part of the brain, the why, 
it, it, it uses the limbic system of the brain, where feelings and emotions and loyalty and meaning and purpose and, and belief, uh, that's where the, these things are stimulated. Why we get out of bed in the morning? Why we brush our teeth? Because we'd like to keep them as long as our lives shall last. We can work from the outside end and attend to the what we do, or we can work from the inside out and attend to the why we do it. We're following along in the diary of the Jesus people recorded in the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, please open it. Acts chapter 2. One day Peter spoke to an anxious crowd who asked what they're supposed to do next. This was Pastor Bev's sermon last week. If you missed it, you can find it in our archives. What does it mean that Jesus was crucified and raised and he left us here with something called the power of the Spirit? What are we supposed to do? Peter said, well, take it seriously. Repent, get baptized, receive the Spirit of Jesus. Acts 2, verse 41, in the message paraphrase, says it this way. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word. They were baptized and signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostle, the life together, and the common meal and the prayers. Now that's church. When Jesus left the earth 50 days earlier, they were a group of 120 people 50 days ago. Now, if we read Acts like a history record, now there are 3,000 more people in the potluck line. Luke, the author of Acts, will tell us many times that this surprising group shares possessions and commitments and responsibilities with an eternal smile on their face. All the believers are of one heart and mind. Acts 4, it's said again. Is this what we've wanted to get back to, church family, these 13 months away from our space where our anthem has been, when can we get back to church? Is this it? We want to be in the space where we're all of one mind and heart. Do a search for Acts chapter 2, the Acts 2 church. Search Acts 2 church, and you'll get about 315 million results. <laughs> Things like the radical Acts 2 church, how to become Acts 2 people, Acts 2 community, Acts 2 ministry, Acts 2 fellowship, Acts 2 family, Acts 2 shelter, Acts 2 and you, Acts 2 recipe, the Acts 2 Baptists, the Acts 2 Methodists or Lutherans, the Acts 2 non-denominational folks. You can be Acts 2 church in Georgia or West Virginia or New York or Idaho in Australia, Asia, Africa, South America. You can be Acts 2 on a motorcycle in a coffee shop in nature inside brick and mortar like this. Acts 2, it's what will solve Christianity's crisis. Recover the Acts 2 model and experience. Listen, I have never liked this passage. I have preached or taught this passage twice in a couple of decades, and I've been critical of others many more times. When Luke reminisces about the good old days of the early church in Acts 2, 2 it's not realistic. The comprehensive language, everyone, all the people, every single one of them behaved well. There were no cynical or critical hearts. No one has selfish moments where they cling to their possessions. Every meal is a celebration, really. People are always joyful and exuberant. Never met the deacon from the church where I grew up who pulled on your ear if you misbehaved on your way to the bathroom. And, and those people who, you know, skip lines for the veggie burgers and skip the work. Luke wants us to believe every leader is wonderful and the church is loyal and there's never a disagreeable moment. Luke creates like a prairie home companion church. Is this what we've longed for these months away from one another? We've missed the community where we shared everything in common. Once upon a time, there was a church, pure, orthodox, joyful, unified. Luke, by the way, is not alone in this snapshot of a perfect church. If we move around our New Testament, we'll find similar summaries, mostly from the Apostle Paul or the Pauline school. 1 Corinthians 14 says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so the church will be built up. Ephesians 5, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of Jesus. Or Colossians 3, 
Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through hymns and songs to the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. They gathered to participate, these first Christians. Each one shares with another, and they pour out what God has poured in during the last week. They are free to stand and sing or share a praise or give a testimony or a new insight. They gather to, to break something loose not to bind it up. They come for the next experience, not a rehearsal of last week or last month. Here's some truth. I've grown up Christian and I've never seen the church, Luke describes. I pastor here. I've never experienced what Luke describes. So why? With, with, with Acts open, what can we say about the Acts 2 community? By the way, this Acts 2 snapshot will be functioning in the background the entire month of May. What can we say about this idyllic community? Here are three observations that have helped me. First of all, this word church, ecclesia. The first person to translate the Bible into English, William Tyndale, now we're 16th century, right? Tyndale refused to translate that word, ecclesia as, ecclesia, as church. He chose to translate it as congregation. Translators of the King James Version, they rejected Tyndale's idea. They said, uh, that's the language of the Puritans. That's nonsense. By the way, politics of translation has a long history. Tyndale's not only burned at the stake, but he's tied up and strangled first and then burned at the stake. So we know he's really dead. So when we read this word in the Bible, it's used 114 times, it means the assembly, the gathered ones, the people. It never meant a building of any kind. George Barna says it's like calling your wife a condominium or your best friend a skyscraper to call the church a building. <laughs> going to church meant going to the people. You can't go to something you are. The earliest Christians, they understood the buildings are not sacred. The people are sacred. The people are the sacred space to go to where the people are. So for about 300 years, we know of no Christian churches built. People meet in homes. They are the church without a building. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says this, You are God's house. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God and God himself is present in you. No one will get by vandalizing God's temple. You can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred. You remember, you are the temple. Person by person, God makes people out of persons. And that's me and that's you. The church is a people. This helps me when I have Acts chapter 2 open. Second, there's eager participation. Over the centuries, we've come to experience church by sitting in rows facing the front, looking at the back of heads, and listening to a select few people who stand up front. We've traded a highly participatory gathering for this more passive assembly. I'm not suggesting this is wrong. I'm asking, what might this mean? The truth is, if we consult the first church manual for the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, 1901, the expected worship service today resembles about what was written then. And if we consult 500 years of Protestant worship, there are few minor adjustments, no real change. None of it really resembles Acts chapter 2. We do what we do because it's what we've done. This week we were reminded, you know, over in the sanctuary in the lower level, we're working on the the repair from the flood, looking at the flooring and the carpet and looking at the carpet that comes up the steps. The carpet team was out here. We we're selecting samples and we we're noticing all of these steps have these ugly rubber toe guards, boot guards, shoe guards on the edge of the step. They, they, all of our steps have them. They look horrible. They're old. They're banged up. But the carpet team, was, they're going to put down they're going to replace what was there. So you must want carpet on the steps and you must want those toe guards because you've always had those toe guards. We're looking at the toe guards this week, Pastor Bev, myself, Steve. What do these things even do? What do you think those toe guards are for? They're to make it safer when we step up and down the steps. Are they to make it easier because church shoes are sometimes slick? Are they, you know... Um, are they to protect us if we fall? One person said they protect us. If you were to hit your head on the edge of the step, that'll hurt. 
But then we found a friend, Arden Bauman, who's been part of this church since he was a little boy. We're talking about, I don't know, in his eighth decade. Arden says, oh, no, no, those tow guards were put down because the carpet got old and it was frayed and ugly on the edges, so we solved it by putting a piece of rubber over the top. That's, that's all it's there for. We were about to put down carpet and tow guards because we've always had tarp, carpet and tow guards, but we haven't. We worship the way we worship because it's the way we worship. We gather the way we gather because it's what we've done. Does it make our worship gatherings unbiblical if it doesn't resemble Acts 2? No. Will it help us be easier on one another when, when we see that we prefer different experiences? Maybe. Will we be easier on the next generations, the younger ones, when they prefer for worship? What they prefer, it's no less biblical than what we've nurtured for hundreds of years. Says William Ng, the once dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, an Anglican priest, he says, marry the spirit of your own generation and you will be a widower in the next. My paraphrase, with Acts 2 in mind, Marry the church of your own generation, and you will be the widower in the next. I do want to acknowledge nostalgia and sentimental longing of previous time and place and experiences. Usually these are happy and pleasant thoughts and sounds and people, and sometimes it's nostalgia operating when we say, I can't wait to go back. It's not wrong. It's simply sentimental. And sometimes it's familiarity, knowing what to expect. It's also not wrong, it's familiar. We could ask ourselves in this intersection between pre and post pandemic, really, when we stand still, are we ready to return to the church community we knew? What might we want to recover? Anything from this eager participation from Acts chapter 2 for our members? What did we lose by putting everyone in pews and facing forward? Number three. What then shall we do with this hyper-idealistic snapshot Luke gives us? Acts 1, 2, and 3. By Acts chapter 3, there's trouble in Luke's story. Two faithful people from the community, they decide not to share. They keep some for themselves, which means they're stealing from the community. Yeah, it's not a perfectly pure and always joyful people. Within three chapters, one couple, one couple, they suffer a terminal consequence. In fact, when the Apostle Paul reflects on this utopian community, he says, 1 Corinthians 3, but for right now, friends, I'm completely frustrated with your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I shall nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, you're really not much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything's going your way. Ah, so there is no fairy tale in Acts. These are not perfect disciples of Jesus. The professor Thomas Long has helped me when he suggests, what if there's a different way to read the book of Acts? What if it's less professional scientific historian and more local church historian, a little bit like Arden Bauman? Sometime in the life of almost every congregation, there will be a member with a long memory and a grateful heart and a little time and, um, well, a laptop, and they'll produce some kind of memory book, the history, a century of the faith and service, let's call it the Providence Church, a century of faith and service at Providence Church. It will sound like this, Thomas Long says. In 1938, Providence Church called Emerson Langley to be the new pastor. His first week, he preached revival services at the church, and the whole town was present. Never had the people of Centerville heard such powerful preaching. Everyone was impressed. All were spiritually renewed. Many joined the church, and the whole community was buzzing with admiration for Providence's new minister and his wife, Irene, a constant helpmate. The whole town present, all were renewed spiritually. What, what is this? Sheer nostalgia? No. No, something happened to create a memory, that's for sure. This isn't simply rose-colored glasses church. Local church historians are people of faith and love and theological hope. 
They describe a church's past in terms of its best hopes for its future. So they tell the story of the church and dates and times and ministers and Sunday schools and buildings and services and cemeteries and people. They tell these stories as it was, yes, but also with the, the church hopes and what the church hopes and trusts it will be one day. It's unmitigated devotion all around, awe upon everyone, the freedom to share all possessions, unbounded goodwill, embracing more and more people. This is the way Luke describes the early church at Pentecost. If Luke is a scientific historian or an academic historian, then the only thing we can say is that this news, since this news from Acts 2, the church has gone downhill ever since. It's sadly depressing. If Luke is a nostalgic romantic, then he simply exaggerated. He exaggerated church history, and he gave us very little comfort for our own hard work these days. If, however, Luke is a radical theologian and a local historian, then he's looked at the life of the church as, as though he's looking through the lens of the Spirit's promise to, to be with the people and to create the community the Spirit promised the Spirit would create. The Spirit promises a community of peace and justice felt in almost laugh, in the laughable locales of local congregations like ours. Luke sees this ongoing life of the community as signs and wonders of the age to come. So perhaps what we need in this intersection between pre- and post-pandemic is precisely what ba Pastor Bev said last week. Did you hear her say, the most radical thing we can do is to come to the temple and declare, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's not too much to expect that coming to the temple to confess Jesus is Lord will gradually bring a new social reality. Jesus is Lord, that is our why. You, you know the anecdote to fuzzy church or shallow church or cautious church or confused church or quiet church or nice church. You know the anecdote? It is the people who return post-pandemic with a clear conviction, Jesus is Lord. It is the most radical claim in the world and it is our why. And it's what we share in common, the story of Jesus. So I pray that these 13 months away from one another provided us some opportunity to reflect on this most radical confession, Jesus is Lord. We've had 13 months feeling restrained or bound or restricted or fill in the blank. What I pray is that in 13 months, something has shifted so much so that we will stand in this space again and we can say, well, that La Sierra church pre-pandemic, that was then. But now, Jesus is Lord. Things might look different. Amen.